Really don't understand it. They say he must have had enough of it by now. But I think that the more I do, it doesn't matter whether it's going on trips or making my own gear, the more I want to do. I think of the trips as a way of relaxing. Some people call it an escape, but I think that's what you need when you live in a highly stressed society like ours. The natural surroundings are fantastic, and you have to keep yourself warm. You make camp, and eating your evening meal can be a real experience. It's another kind of life, and that really helps me to relax. I dream a lot, and I think really it's dreaming that keeps me going. I probably manage things without the dreams, but they give me that extra push. They really give me a lot. I can't imagine how things would be without them. I really don't know how it all began. Okay, when I was a boy, I was crazy about Indians and their canoes. When I was 16, I went on my first canoe trip. And from then on, I was hooked. I've been paddling canoes since I was 16, mostly in Sweden. And in 82, I went on a trip with some Swedish friends to Alaska. After that trip, I started building my own canoes and making my own equipment. In 86, I went to Canada again. And on that trip, I saw the big Voyager canoes, which have always fascinated me. After that, I've used all my spare time and resources on the one thing that's been on my mind to build a big north canoe and paddle down the Tornia River, starting in the land of the midnight sun, the largest of the remaining free rivers in Scandinavia. It's strange to think, quite fantastic really, that a few sheets of foam, some woven fiber and resin, just a few bits of material, can be put together to produce a canoe nine meters in length, built in two sections and able to haul two to three tons. I realized that the materials used are a far cry from nature, but because of the challenges, the things I want to do, I'm forced to construct the canoe with the help of these strong materials. They give a reasonable chance of making sure that the canoe won't break up if we hit rocks. It's very important to protect yourself when you're working with these products, to avoid contact with your skin or inhaling the fumes. <laughs> First, we cover the foam with a layer of yellow Kevlar fiber. This fiber is five times stronger than steel. It was invented for use in the space industry and is now used for racing cars, fishing rods, bulletproof vests, and canoes. Things which have to be both strong and light. On top of the Kevlar fiber, we put a layer of glass fiber and extra layers to reinforce particularly vulnerable places where the canoe is likely to get the most knocks. Most of the good advice and tips I've gotten have come from the US and Canada, but I've also learned a great deal by experimenting myself. When the outer surface is hardened, I remove the fiber and foam from the framework. I had hoped that the finished canoe would weigh 100 kilos, but with seats, gunnels, and boats, the total weight is 140 kilos. When the inner surface has been covered with fiber, a sandwich construction is produced. I'm a carpenter by trade. For me, the ideal material to work with is wood. The gunnels gives the canoe its final shape and finish. The sun symbolizes the land of the midnight sun. That's where we're going to paddle. The cranes and the loons, birds that remind me of the wilderness. In May, Two months before the trip to the Tornio River, the canoe was ready, so we took it to southern Sweden to try it out in some rapids. I think it's important to make preparations. It also increases the chances of success. 
and it's always exciting to see whether your homemade gear is good enough. There could be problems steering this big canoe. The most difficult part is for the six of us to think and paddle as a team. We use the same paddling technique as we would in an ordinary two-seater, teamwork, front and rear, for steering and maneuvering. The technique we use most in the rapids is called ferrying. This is done with the stern, or as here, with the bow turned into the current. Our strength against the current, the force of the current against the side of the canoe, and the angle towards the current causes the canoe to move sideways. When the water flows quickly past a small point or a large rock, the current is reversed, forming an eddy. The current turns and flows opposite the main current towards the rock. Here you can stop and rest, make plans, or avoid something hazardous ahead. And it's also great fun to swing in and out of an eddy. When you back paddle, break through big waves, you don't get so much water in the canoe, and there's more time to spot rocks and avoid them. It's a question of using the current to your own advantage, allowing it to help you instead of fighting it. Så er det bare hive i pælerne, ikke? og så for eksempel lave bagvandsindsvingning og sådan noget. Ikke? Altså det finder vi forhåbentlig ud af undervejs, ikke? uden alt for mange øh, skæbnesvange oplevelser. Ikke? Our canoe is a voyager. They were originally used as freighters on the many rivers and lakes in Canada. The voyagers, the canoe crew, provided the power. They had to be small in order to make room for the cargo, which could, for example, be tons of skins. The working day often started at two in the morning and went for 16 to 18 hours. They used a very rapid rhythm when they paddled and would sing in time with it. Sometimes they had to pull the big canoes against the current, wading in cold water. When they had to carry the cargo and the canoe to go around rapids and waterfalls, they carried at least 90 kilos each. They were good at their job, but when things went wrong and they capsized, they usually drowned because they couldn't swim. A north canoe like the one I've built was used for expeditions and freight north and west of the Great Lakes. When I saw the big canoes in Canada, they lit a spark in my imagination. The dream of making my own canoe, getting a team together, and finding a big river in Scandinavia. Our stern paddler is called Søren. He's 27 and a joiner by trade. He now works at a youth club. He's been paddling in competitions for many years. Søren makes a lot of his own equipment. He's paddled on rivers in Scandinavia and Europe and was with me on the trip to Canada last year. Second from the stern is Juren. He's a forestry worker, 43, and used to life in the open air. Juren is an expert in lighting campfires. We're hardly out of the boat before Juren has a fire going to boil water for coffee and tea. He's been paddling canoes since he was 14, and the idea of a trip on a long river in Sweden like the Tornio has always been one of his ambitions. Ole is an electrical engineer. He's 24 and takes part in competition canoeing in Denmark. His interest for canoeing on rivers started a couple years ago, and now he's mad about it. Together with Søren, Olin has played an important part in the Tornio River trip, the cooking. Three good Danish paddlers in the stern of the canoe. In the fore end of the canoe, we have two Danes and a Swede, Gert Ove. He's 37 years old and lives in Gothenburg, where he works as a civil servant. Ove has been paddling for many years and has also paddled in Canada. He really enjoys canoeing, which enables him to get out and enjoy unspoiled natural surroundings. Next to Ova sits Wauna. She's 30 years old and a qualified nurse. Hopefully, we won't be needing her professional skills on the trip. She first started canoeing about 10 years ago, which was when we met. Her basic reason for being on the trip is to be in the outdoors and the fresh air. She's never been on this type of long trip with so many rapids, and she's worried it'll be tough going. I sit at the front. That's what I prefer when there are rapids ahead and the water is fast moving. You have the best view of the water and rocks here in the front. This is our team. Our trial trip went quite well, and on July 3rd, we packed the van and trailer and began our 30-hour drive. 
2,000 kilometers up to the Torneal River in the land of the midnight sun, north of the Arctic Circle. At last it's time to assemble the canoe for the big trip, the Torneo River. We're finally here, after all the construction work on the canoe, all the preparations. It's been hard now and then, especially listening to the pessimists. Lots of people express doubts about our venture, especially the building of the boat in two halves. But I try to use my common sense and experience, and listen mainly to those who give me encouragement. Before we tried out the canoe in southern Sweden, I had nightmares about leaky joins, canoes breaking apart, and other problems. But now I'm confident that the joins and the rest of the canoe can stand up to the punishment of the Tornio River. It's a journey of 500 kilometers from here to the town of Tornio, at the mouth of the river. We must be there within the next 10 to 12 days. Nearly everything is packed in watertight barrels, and it's all tied securely to the canoe, so they don't lose anything if we capsize. We have a barrel each containing our own personal belongings, two changes of clothing and a sleeping bag. We have cooking utensils and a small oven, and we have all the food we will need on the trip with us. It's fine to sit and make preparations and look at the map in winter months, but being here, getting the paddles into the water, that's the best part. One and a half days on Tornatrask, Sweden's largest mountain lake. Fair winds and sail, but also paddling brings us to the start of the Tornio River. This rapid is called Tarakuka by the laps. It's short, but turbulent. The temperature of the water is only three degrees, 
We are tired. It's late in the evening, so we don't take any chances. We carry the canoe past the first rapid. As a river flows more steeply, rapids and waterfalls with eddies, waves and spray are created. This makes paddling really spectacular and exciting, but also demanding and dangerous. Before you paddle through rapids, you read the water. You study the rapids to find the best route through. When huge volumes of water rush over big rocks and stones, you get a white spray. This indicates a hole, and large holes must be avoided at all costs. By examining the surface of the water, we can see where the rocks lie concealed beneath and whether there is a way through them. Vakokoski, the next chain of rapids. We've been down to take a look and have decided which way we should paddle through. Vakokoski consists of three rapids, the first being the most difficult. When we looked at the rapids, the waves appeared high, perhaps a meter, but actually they were three meters high. We should have kept more to the right, and before long we ran broadside to the current, but, but we managed to straighten up a bit before the waves rocked the canoe. An exciting start. A couple of times I thought to myself, we're not going to make it, we'll capsize, but the canoe proves incredibly stable and seaworthy. I made the spray cover at the front of the canoe to prevent too much water from splashing inside as the bow plunges into the waves. It worked just fine. Without it, we definitely would have sunk. At each end of the canoe, we always have a 25 meter lifeline in case of capsizing, something you should always be prepared for. When you paddle through rapids, your life jacket is just as important as your paddle. And when you roll over, it's crucial to avoid being crushed between the canoe and the rocks. It's vital to keep yourself upstream of the canoe, not downstream, and to keep your head, saving your strength and energy until you reach a place where the water is calmer, and then try to get ashore. We've capsized on nearly all of our trips, but luckily, none of us has been hurt. Unfortunately, though, you do hear and read about people who get injured or drowned. If you make thorough preparations and have good equipment, you can cut the risks, but of course you can't eliminate them completely. The Torneo River has always been on my list of the places I would most like to paddle. The river starts at Tornatrask, which is the seventh largest lake in Sweden, 
and is situated 345 meters above sea level. The last 200 kilometers of the river form the border between Sweden and Finland. The total length of the river from its source to the sea is 510 kilometers. This makes it the longest of the four undeveloped rivers in Sweden. By undeveloped, I mean no dams, no hydroelectric power stations, with water flowing freely from the mountains to the sea. Actually, this is one of the threatened rivers because someone wants to build dams and hydroelectric plants. Plans have already been made. Perhaps it will be the Torniel River, perhaps one of the others. Hopefully none of them, because there are very few free rivers left in Scandinavia. Our children should also have the chance to see a free river someday. After two days relaxing in the pleasant little town of Jukisjavi, we paddle on. One of the rapids which people talk about is called Paranki. It's three kilometers long, the most difficult on this stretch, and it worries us. One of the things I like best about nature is that it doesn't care who we are or what we are. Nature treats everybody the same. You can't buy nature. Out there, we're all equal. There's no discrimination. Seventh day. We've paddled about 200 kilometers and we reach Marisalinka. It's one of the most dangerous rapids on the river, at least for those who don't know about it or who don't go down for a look at it first. When you examine this rapid from the canoe, it seems easy. The right side looks the easiest, but there's no real chance of making it there. Once again, we use the backing technique, angling the canoe a little into the current making a fairing maneuver which would keep us out to the left. As I stand looking at the rapids, I can see how dangerous they are, but it's only when I talk to someone else about them that the question of death arises. Water fascinates me. Not necessarily the danger involved. It's not essential for me for life to hang by a thin thread. Life is too good to throw away. <laughs> we 
We have a small oven with us, so we can enjoy fresh baked bread every day. Sometimes we have cinnamon buns and sweet sugar cakes. We have a supply of beetroots, red cabbage, carrots, and onions for making salad. The hot meals consist of rice, mashed potatoes, spaghetti, pancakes, and smoked meat with vegetables. Breakfast is oat porridge, rolls, or rye pancakes. Every day we have a bag of nuts, raisins, and chocolate with us in the boat, fuel for tired arms. Hey! 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 Eight days ago, we started on the Tornatresk near Abisko, not far from Narvik. First, the 75 kilometer long lake. Then, after Karuna and Jukashavi, came many rapids. And now, here, after 225 kilometers of paddling, we passed the Tarendo River. 50% of the water from the Tornio flows via the Tarendo into the Calix River. And this means less water and more rocks and rapids yet to come. The Torne rapids, in particular, can present problems of maneuvering for the long canoe. Capsizing is an ordeal. The canoe is so big and heavy. Suddenly everyone lands in the water. You can't see the rest of the group. Is anyone missing? Everything happens so quickly. There's nobody to help you. And the next stretch of rapids is only 700 meters off. Ova is standing on the rock, which flipped us over in the middle of the rapid. He has no choice now but to jump in and let the current take him. Rauna is the most shaken. She had the roughest ride to the rapid. The rest of us empty the canoe and paddle up to the rapid. We wait, dripping wet and freezing. The water is only seven degrees. It's very important to keep your legs free and not get a foot caught between the rocks. Otherwise, you can be forced down by the strong current and drown.
spørgsmål er bare, hvornår vi når det. The sack containing the oven and the large saucepans, along with Søren's camera box, wasn't tied down, so all these things had been lost. We suffered a large crack in the rear of the canoe. We patch it with strong tape, so it'll stay watertight for the time being. We've recovered most of what we lost yesterday, but the two fiber skins, the oven, and the large saucepans are gone. Now we are just above the Kinjus Rapids. They are the largest rapids on the Tornio River and cannot be negotiated. But here you have to be careful that you don't unintentionally get carried by the current and pulled down into the rapids. After the Kangas Rapid, we reach the border between Sweden and Finland. The weather is better, and that cheers us up after several rainy days and our capsizing. We pass the Leno and Munio, the two largest tributaries of the Tornio River. And now there is plenty of water in the Tornio River again. There are about 200 kilometers left to the town of Tornio and the sea. We take it easy today, but still manage to paddle 80 kilometers. We make camp 100 meters from the Arctic Circle. It's been a hot day, but now the temperature has dropped to minus two centigrade. It's almost three o'clock and the others have turned in. The moon hangs over Finland and the midnight sun sets just for a short while before rising for yet another long day. We're okay, despite the aches and bruises. Before we tackle the final rapids, the canoe has to be repaired. It's unbelievable how much power there is in the river. The ultra-strong fiber has been ripped in two as if it were paper. All that work. But of course, it could have been worse. It could have been totally wrecked. Luckily, none of us was injured. Just a few bruises to remind us of the experience. We repair the canoe, because today we head for the Matkakovsky Rapid. Everything has to be in good shape. Rana decides this formidable rapid is not for her. Some people would certainly say we're mad. Why try to paddle through this formidable rapid? The rock in the middle of the Matkakovsky Rapid was notorious back in the days when they transported logs down the river. The rock claimed the lives of many raftsmen. As usual, I'm a bit scared and nervous. At the same time, I can't deny the feeling of excitement. The water crashes against the rock and is forced to the side, forming a seething white hole behind it. The difference in water level around the rock is two meters. We have to be careful not to run into the stones and capsize just in front of the rock. There are a lot of stones far out on the right side of the rapids too. We lie to the left of the big rock and we have to pass on the right. And I think we'll make it.
Gillar du din sömn? Ska ni helst snacka? Den är bra. Ja, ja. Vi gör lite fler. Ja, du, du har lyckats med dem mycket. Ja, tur får man ha. Och skicklighet, framförallt. Oh, det ser ut som om det är för rimligt. Vi får alltså jämvärmet till de här kanelsnäckorna, Micke. Det är gott att vara för varm. Det var lite smidigt med ugnen. Ja, det förstår jag. Det var ju otur att vi missade den i en fot. It's a marvelous experience following the river from the mountains to where it ends. A living artery that enriches the landscape through which it passes. I don't understand why everybody doesn't take up canoeing. For me, it's the best way of spending my life. And more and more people are taking up canoeing and other forms of outdoor pursuits. That's why it's so important that everyone cleans up after themselves. For us, it's become a kind of sport to leave as few traces as possible. That makes it pleasant for the next visitors and saves the environment. All too often, both remote places and those more easily accessible are spoiled by the presence of refuse, plastic, human litter, and that's just no good. We really have to think about nature and the environment and make sure that we protect things as they are now. We must all make an effort to ensure that coming generations can also enjoy the natural surroundings. Vi starter deroppe af den første højde kugle. Ja, en kugle får sådan en meget bred tur. Altså det, jeg har set af billeder af den, ikke? Så det er sådan noget med øvrigt. Der må være en sten. Der er vandet det her heroppe. Er det her dernede, der er lidt tændt smænd? Ja, men den er bred alligevel. Matka Koski is a wonderful campsite, and probably the last one on this trip. Now, after paddling for 10 days, we expect to reach the sea. There are 50 kilometers and one series of rapids to go. Vi kan tage lidt mere, endnu mere her over imod, ikke? Så altså, vi ikke kommer i de værste bølge, men det overgår hovedstrømmen. Jeg er bange for det, hvis vi går ned i det store ved der, så kommer det er, vi ikke over til ind i de store bølge, så når vi slet ikke herovre i højre side. Nå, men altså, så lad os øh, prøve at se, når vi kommer derover. Først er der hvide, ikke? Ja. Så er der sådan en masse hvide topper, så kommer der ligesom sådan et stykke, hvor vandet bare løber sådan... Hvor det falder. Ja, hvor det falder, hvor det ikke løber noget særligt. Der skal man tage lige højre siden af det, ikke? Og så, hvis vi kører så i kanten af bølgerne, og så bare glider ud på den tunge, der løber ud der, ikke? Der er ingen ja. grund til at tage, tage mere til højre, det er i hvert fald heller, heller til venstre næsten. We say goodbye to the Kokola Rapid and the Kokola Fishermen. Goodbye to the Tornio River and all its rapids. Both the rapids and the fishermen will disappear unless the river is allowed to remain undeveloped, one of the last free rivers. Behind us lie many great memories of our experiences, and there is still more to experience. One of the best things about completing a trip and returning to civilization 
is knowing there are still more rivers to challenge and nature to see. There will be future trips to plan for. Many people doubted the whole idea, my plans for constructing the canoe and the homemade equipment. That makes the feeling of standing here after having succeeded even better. To have an idea or a dream and then make plans which in turn make the dream or idea into reality, that's what it's all about. <laughs>